professor sir and my dear students i welcome you all to the today's session on uh, continuation of uh, liver and anesthesiologist and oh, over to professor and students uh, thank you uh, we are on time for the last class of the year and uh, <clears throat> Last class we discussed liver mostly with regard to a pathology called uh, cirrhosis and uh, decompensated liver disease. But uh, from the examination point of view and also from practical point of view, there is another pathological condition of the liver called obstructive jaundice, which is asked as a theory question in uh, uh, clinical management section of the third paper. How will you manage a patient with obstructive jaundice coming for uh, either the removal of the cause for the obstruction or for an incidental surgery? And uh, because that is has been asked uh, repeatedly over the years, mm -hmm. I thought we will discuss that as a separate topic, not clubbing it with cirrhosis or decompensated liver disease. Another important topic is. Uh, Hepatitis B infection, which is also a very important topic, uh, not discussed very well in any of the textbooks. But if you plan to become a, an intensive care specialist, you may have to know some facts about treating the patient, uh, the clinical signs and symptoms, how hepatitis B happens, and what is the management and what is the prognosis, all that you have to know. And the third important uh, thing uh, related to liver is needle stick injury. As a medical professional or healthcare professional, we handle sharp things like uh, syringes with needles or uh, scalpels. When you want to do a central line, you invariably <laughs> use a very sharp instrument. So the needle stick injury, which uh, can transmit some of the deadliest infections, we face that professional hazard of uh, uh, sharp uh, obturating injuries, which also are asked in the theory, and also we have to know how to protect ourselves from this uh, professional hazard. So these three topics we will discuss today in the continuation of liver and uh, anesthesiologist. So first will be obstructive jaundice, and second will be hepatitis B and third will be needle stick injury or sharp injuries to the healthcare professionals. So, and again, this is going to be in the form of a question and answer or interactive session like last class. So I will try to <coughs> share my screen with you. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Right. So this is the first question. How do you define? Uh, how do you define obstructive jaundice? How to? What is the definition of obstructive jaundice? Can anyone tell me the definition of obstructive jaundice? Sir, uh, it is defined as increase in plasma bilirubin level due to an obstruction in the mm. uh, in the mm. hepatobiliary system or mm. so it is mainly an obstruction to the flow of the bile. Correct, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, yes. What is getting obstructed? The uh, bile flow from the liver ultimately to its destination into the intestine is obstructed. And where all can it get obstructed? Inside the liver, outside the liver, or both? Both, sir. Both, yeah. You can have intrahepatic as well as yes. intrahepatic obstruction, isn't it? So the definition is failure of normal amount of bile to reach the intestine due to mechanical obstruction of the extrahepatic biliary tree or within the porta hepatic, that is within the biliary liver itself. So failure of normal amount of bile to reach the intestine, which is the 
important thing that has to happen one of the functions of the liver is to secrete bile and send it into the intestine for various activities so failure of normal amount of bile to reach the intestine due to it can be a mechanical obstruction like a stone or a growth or an obstruction example of it so mechanical obstruction of the extra hepatic biliary tree or within the porta hepatis this is the definition of obstructive jaundice now at what levels of bilirubin yellow discoloration is seen in sclera and skin and why these structures are affected normally we define jaundice as yellow discoloration occurring in the sclera and skin isn't it that is the clinical definition of jaundice yellowish discoloration of the skin and sclera mainly sclera and skin and uh, what is the blood level of bilirubin required to produce this yellow discoloration in sclera and skin is there any value for that what is the normal value of uh, bilirubin less than 1.2 Ah, point eight to one point two. That should be the normal. The range always we must say the range. Point eight to one point two is the normal level of bilirubin. So when the bilirubin starts rising, at what level you will see the discoloration in the sclera, and what level you will see the discoloration in the skin? Five to twenty gram in the sclera and five milligram in the skin, sir. Yeah, sclera is three milligram. Okay. You, at three milligrams, when the, the blood bilirubin level increases to three milligram, you will see yellow discoloration of sclera. And when it reaches six milligram, then it will affect the skin and mucous membrane. And why did these structures are affected is because these structures have a component called elastin, and the elastin absorbs bilirubin much. highly compared to all other structures so that is the reason why these two, uh, two three structures namely sclera skin and mucous membrane they exhibit the yellowish discoloration because of the not your tongue not your lips all these things don't ex exhibit that that is because the bilirubin has an eye affinity for the elastin which is present in the sclera and also in the other structures called skin and mucous membrane and that is the reason why you get the yellowish discoloration so now this is some of the basic questions that may be asked in the examination in the viva also so i thought you should be aware of that what are the differential diagnosis of this yellow discoloration what other conditions can cause a little bit of yellowishness but not due to the rise in bilirubin vitamin It's a toxicity ah keratin vitamin a high dosage okay so beta carotenemia and twin atherin therapy malingering with citric acid they, but they don't stain the mucous mucous membrane and sclera but bilirubin levels rise up to maximum within 3 weeks and then stabilize that point over the bilirubin which is uh, having an obstruction level or because of hepatitis whenever it rises it goes up to keeps on rising up to 3 weeks and then stabilizes what is occult jaundice not seen externally sir the clinically uh, it is not seen but blood levels will be no what is the blood level at which you will say it is occult jaundice One normal to three milligrams. Ah, two milligrams. So yes. normal bilirubin is point eight to one point two, but when it rises up, up to two milligram, there won't be any yellowish discoloration. This is called occult jaundice. So when you test the blood, the bilirubin level is more than one point two, but below two milligram. And clinically, when you check the sclera, mucous membrane, skin, you don't find any yellowish thing at all. so this will happen especially in hepatitis a infection patient will have nausea vomiting but uh, yellow discoloration will not be there urine will be normal color but when you test the blood it will be 1.8 1.6 or less than 
and that is the prodromal stage that is the beginning of the scale after some time it will start going up to you know beyond 2 mg when it will become clinically exhibited as a low discoloration especially when it reaches 3 mg so if a person's sclera is yellowish you can be sure that the blood level will be 3 mg and if the mucous membrane and skin are also <coughs> yellowish in color then you can be sure that the bilirubin value will be more than 6 mg so this is the importance of knowing these values now what are the causes of obstructive jaundice we have already seen the definition that it can be a mechanical obstruction outside the liver or extra hepatic or it can be porta hepatitis or inside the liver biliary so based on that you can classify the causes as extra hepatic and intra hepatic. What are the causes of intra hepatic obstruction? What are the causes of extra hepatic obstruction? So, congenital and acquired causes, sir. Okay. Congen in congen because of uh, biliary sclerosis and biliary atresia, there will be ah. obstructive jaundice, sir. Ah, that can also be called intrahepatic because this change occurs within the biliary tree in the liver. Okay, so yes, biliary atresia, sclerosis, all these things take place intrahepatically. Hmm. Acquired causes like stenosis, uh, gallstones. Hmm. So it is better to classify them as uh, intrahepatic and extrahepatic rather than acquired and uh, congenital because most of the familial or uh, congenital causes are all mainly because of the uh, familial dis uh, disorders like Dugin Johnson syndrome, rotor syndrome, cholestatic jaundice of pregnancy, recurrent intrahepatic cholestasis, biliary atresia, all these things. And acquired causes can be cholestatic drugs, viral or alcoholic hepatitis. And uh, whenever you introduce total parental nutrition, you may get a bit of a jaundice and uh, biliary cirrhosis and sclerosing cholangitis. Whereas the extra hepatic causes can be classified into benign and malignant causes. The benign causes can be again gallstone, cholidocolithiasis, which will have a clinical features of uh, previous history of dyspepsia, intermittent pyrexia, rider pain, jaundice, or positive Murphy sign, which is what is positive Murphy sign? So pain in the Sorry. right subcostal tenderness in the right subcostal region on pressing. How, the, how do you, how do you demonstrate that? Is it a, is it elicited sign or is it a constant sign? Elicited sign, sir. We have to ah. ask the patient to take deep breath and. Uh, press to, over the right over the right hypochondria. Right, I mean, uh, subcostal or subcostal area. Then patient yes. will have a sharp pain during pain, the yes. deep inspiration. Okay, so that is called the Murphy sign. And chronic pancreatitis or stitches, all these things are benign causes and parasitic infections. Sometimes you know in small kids, ascariasis can go and block the bile duct or. Uh, uh, reverse way it can enter the common bile duct and block it. So, and uh, polydocosystole, all these things are benign conditions. In malignancy, form, commonly patients uh, may have carcinoma of the end of the pancreas or ampulla, bile duct uh, cancer, gallbladder cancers. And these are clinically painless progressive deep jaundice. Unlike the inflammation, which causes pain. This malignant jaundice is a painless jaundice. Weight loss will be there. And there is a palpable gland bladder, uh, which is called the curvoisier sign. The deep jaundice, intermittent deep jaundice, all these things are the causes. So remember to classify into intrahepatic and extrahepatic so that you can include both acquired and congenital conditions in this rather than trying to classify them as acquired and uh, congenital causes. What are the differences between intra and extra hepatic obstruction? Will there be any difference if uh, a person gets a, say, a biliary <coughs> obstruction inside the 
liver like uh, uh, pleurosing cholangitis or uh, filaria atresia in children what will be the clinic how to clinically differentiate whether it is a intrahepatic obstruction or a, a extrahepatic obstruction based on the jaundice will the intensity of jaundice be different with in a patient with a intra and extrahepatic obstruction or will it be the same the color of the jaundice will it be the uniform yellow color in all patients or will there be different shades of yellowishness it will be same only same only mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then i'll show you next slide what will be the different shades but the, the abdominal pain will be there mostly in extrahepatic whereas if it is intrahepatic mostly patient will not have much of pain and fever will be there mostly when the patient has extrahepatic obstruction intrahepatic like bilirubin atresia and cholangitis fever may be absent there will be some prodrome especially when a patient gets hepatitis and then gets uh, jaundice there will be a prodromal stage as i said the occult jaundice will occur at the time patient will have nausea vomiting and all those prodromal symptoms some patients present with only itching or bradycardia all these things are prodromal symptoms which are mainly absent in extrahepatic and if, if you take the drug history it will be positive in intrahepatic obstruction most of the time because it's a mechanical obstruction in intra extra hepatic drug history will not be positive and uh, history of surgery will be positive in extra hepatic somebody has undergone a gallbladder surgery a, a, a polycystectomy then they can develop extra hepatic obstruction because of the scarring on the some obstruction whereas it will be absent in intra hepatic and risk of transfusion previous blood transfusions that will be positive in intrahepatic absent in extrahepatic and family history also will be positive for example biliary atresia a child born with a biliary atresia there may be a positive family history some other sibling or elders suffering from that and stigma for cirrhosis is not present in extrahepatic it may be present in intrahepatic encephalopathy will be more common with intrahepatic rather than extrahepatic and patient normalizing with vitamin k will be mostly in extrahepatic rather than in intrahepatic so these are all the differences that you can think of for extrahepatic and intrahepatic obstructive jaundice now what is the cause of pruritus in obstructive jaundice patients with obstructive jaundice initially they may come only with very severe scratching or itching complaint so what is the cause we have discussed this already bile in the last class salts. when we talked about it hmm. due to bile salts on bile salts yes <clears throat> and what is the what are the theories proposed for this obstruction why this is uh, the bile salts how do they cause this pruritus i told you rapidly in the last class because uh, the phones were dying out so i made it a rapid uh, mention about it so there are two mechanism one is called the central mechanism where there is increase in central opioidergic tone in patients with cholestasis so any patient with an obstruction because of the uh, to the flow of bile the opioid uh, receptors in the central nervous system are stimulated so normally one of the side effects of opioid all of you know that when you administer a opioid drug like morphine or fentanyl patient may complain of pruritus especially if you intrathecally give morphine one of the very distressing problem is pruritus nose patient will be feeling itchy sensation in the nose so that mechanism is applied here also the peripheral mechanism is there are lot of accumulation of substances like one is bile acids another is histamine third is serotonin and also endogenous opioids which are all normally metabolized by the 
presence of bile when it is not there these uh, uh, inducers substances increase in their amount so they are not uh, broken down <clears throat> so in the absence of their uh, metabolism there is an increase in uh, histamine serotonin and also endogenous opioids other than bile salts so they continue to circulate in the systemic circulation and they also uh, result in the uh, patient developing severe pruritus so how can you treat this pruritus sometimes it may be so severe the patient will demand treatment for that so how can you treat this pruritus any medicines you can give based on the mechanisms ondansetron can ondansetron also can be because that is serotonin is there uh, ondansetron is an antihistamine ah you can give antihistamines for this what do you do central opioid analgesic tone increase what is the antidote for opioid poisoning naloxone naloxone so ah so you can give opioid antagonists like naloxone can give polystyramine even rifampicin which is given for tuberculosis treatment which will in induce cp450 enzymes and inactivates all the spirulinogens that also has been tried pinobarbitone oral gamma gamma uh, gamma agar actually or gum or hydroxy antagonist that is uh, ondansetron or urodeoxycholic acid and propofol lidocaine charcoal and very severe cases even hemofiltration to remove all these substances plasma pheresis ileal diversion and finally liver transplantation okay so this much of treatment has sometimes warranted for the pruritus which can be very very severe what other complication can be de detected from the scratch marks due to pruritus supposing patient has a very severe pruritus and keeps on scratching so some people take even uh, stone and try to rub it bricks so much of uh, uh, itching will be there so if you find a very deep scratch mark along with the problem of pruritus what other failure or the exhibition of uh, liver failure activity you can detect in that encephalopathy encephalopathy patient how will he is scratch he will be altered sensorium will be there no from the scratch marks what can you detect what will happen if you rub yourself or scratch yourself very severely wheel reaction wheel reaction in mild form very severe you can bleeding bleeding from the skin ah so bleeding from the scratch marks indicates coagulation of the normal okay so patients who have a simple wheel like scratch marks are milder but if all the scratch marks are showing uh, <coughs> clotted blood blood which is uh, bleeding has occurred and they have dried up and you see clotted blood there that means it's a coagulation abnormality if you check the inr it will be very very high okay so it will not be normal it will be abnormal so that is one of the indicator to find out the coagulation abnormality from scratch mark also now another common question examination you have to face in liver cases is how is the metabolism of bilirubin taking place describe the metabolism of bilirubin how is it first formed how is it transported what happens to it after transportation and where exactly or finally it is deposited and what is its role first of all how is it formed where from is it the obtained breakdown from, of, from breakdown the breakdown of rbcs breakdown of rbcs rbcs all rbcs what is the adjective you should say for the rbcs matured rbcs effete old rbcs it is called effete e f f e t e effete is the word that you have to use or senescent rbcs which have lived up to 120 days which is their life span 4 months is the life span of a rbc which is formed in the body after 120 days it becomes what is called old 
or repeat or senescent rbcs which are no more likely to live so these rbcs are broken down not the freshly formed are the rbcs less than 120 days will not be broken down unless you have a hemolytic problem okay so in the normal physiology only epit or senescent rbcs of more than 120 days life span they are broken down where are they broken down in the spleen too in the reticular endothelial system okay which consists of spleen bone marrow okay all these things are included in reticular endothelial system so once the rbc is broken what are the substances are obtained from that inside the rbc what do you what do you have to carry oxygen heme and globin ah you have hemoglobin <laughs> so this hemoglobin has to be broken down into heme moiety and globin moiety what is globin it is a protein which is used it is for a protein yeah, this is simple as that it's a protein yeah. so protein will be reabsorbed or again reconstructing or producing further hemoglobin and the heme has to be broken down and what does that heme contain iron porphyrin iron porphyrin yes very good so this is the picture you will see these are all the epit or more than 120 days old rbcs which are broken down by the reticular endothelial system from which the heme is separated and heme from there heme only you get the bilirubin and the bilirubin is transported to the liver in the blood but it cannot travel because it is unconjugated bilirubin it is not uh, it will be not be able to travel on its own so it combines with albumin and then it is transported because albumin is the carrier for this and this unconjugated bilirubin comes to the liver and it is separated from the carrier albumin and then glucuronic acid is added to that to make it conjugated okay so then only it will become water soluble and it can be excreted by the kidney or other structures so the idea of uh, converting into conjugated bilirubin with glucuronic acid is to make it what is called polar or water soluble substance and then it is deposited along conjugated bilirubin bile only uh, bilirubin only is uh, uh, sent to the intestines in the duodenum second part of duodenum through the bile and in the bile what happens there is 90% free of it back to the liver through the portal circulation and the small percentage goes in the feces as tercobilin what is the role of this tercobilin it gives the pigment to the feces ah it makes the color of the feces that is why when you have an obstructive jaundice what will be the color of the feces described as dark dark <laughs> Um, it's called clay colored, clay colored stools. Okay, if you have clay color, that is a normal yellowish color is not there. It is called clay colored stools. So whenever patient says my stool is almost whitish or clay color, very very light uh, brown color, then it is that one of the symptoms of obstruction. So tercobilin gives the color to the feces. Similarly. urobilin gives the color to your urine also so 10% goes to the kidney and gets excreted as urobilinogen and uh, that is the we have converted to urobilin which also gives that light straw colored appearance for your normal urine okay so this is the whole metabolism of so, acid rbc is broken down globin separated and reabsorbed heme broken down into can converted to bilirubin of course there is a small step there how it is done and then it is transported with uh, along with albumin to the liver and there it is uh, conjugated with glucuronic acid then uh, goes to the intestine from intestine part of it goes gets reabsorbed part of it enters the uh, main circulation to go to the kidney and part of it is excreted in the feces so this is the total circulation of 
nirubhi so how much of bile is formed per day what is the amount of bile secretion that is taking place just like uh, we whenever we talk about csf we talk about how much of csf is formed per day a yeah, question may be asked how much of bile is formed per day no idea sir no idea total bile flow is 600 ml per day or it can be from the 500 to 1000 ml per day which is the rate depending upon the amount of fatty food and other things you take because bile is very important for absorption of your fat and which parts of the liver contribute to this and what factors contribute to this that is the uh, in the among the liver structures where exactly the bile is produced which cells in the liver produce the bile we have seen the last class the three lobules the hepatic lobule the portal lobule and portal lacinus and in that we talked about hepatic lobule mainly for the direction of blood flow the portal lobule mainly for the direction of bile flow and portal lacinus for the enzymatic activity you remember the diagram we showed in yes, the last sir. class yes sir uh, so here which structure should be producing the bile hepatocytes okay yes it is not only produced in the hepatocytes but also produced by the cholangiocytes which are lining the bile uh, biliary canaliculi so there are two structures which produce bile one is hepatocyte component is about almost 450 ml out of the 600 ml the hepatocytes produce 450 ml of bile and it can be bile salt dependent due to biliary glutathione or ductal bicarbonate secretion these factors only stimulate that so depending upon the glutathione level and the bicarbonate secretion these uh, stimulations cause the hepatocytes to stimulate i mean produce bile and the cholangiocytes which are nothing but the cells lining the biliary canaliculi they also produce almost 150 ml of bile so the total 600 is not all all from the hepatocyte alone majority two thirds is by hepatocyte and one third is by the cholangiocytes which are lining the biliary canaliculi okay. which hormone causes the stimulation of bile apart from these two structures glutathione and bicarbonate which directly stimulate the hepatocyte to produce is there any hormone control for the stimulation of bile cholecystokinin sir cholecystokinin for contraction of gall bladder mm -hmm. this is secretin you see main also the stimulation of bile there is secretin produced you see it in the gastrointestinal system and uh, anesthesia from the secretory stomach produced in the gastric parietal cell okay secretory and what is the total bilirubin value what is the percentage of conjugated bilirubin in this what is the normal bilirubin value we have seen uh, that total bilirubin 0.2 to 1 uh, total bilirubin is 0.3 to 1.2 and conjugated should be less than 15% of that okay so you had always when you see the liver function test you will have total bilirubin value then you will have conjugated bilirubin and unconjugated bilirubin both when combined together should be equal to the total bilirubin that is how the report will be given so you have to of that only 15% less than 15% will be conjugated the remaining will be unconjugated bilirubin what is the equivalent of 1 mg of bilirubin in millimole nowadays uh, many textbooks give the values in millimoles you all know that uh, even your normal blood sugar which we describe in milligrams is only calculated in millimoles in western countries they don't talk any more of uh, milligrams so how much of glucose how many millimoles of glucose is there in 1 mg of glucose How do you convert? 
Any idea? Supposing you have 100 milligram of, of uh, blood sugar, how much is there in millimoles? You must divide it by 80. Okay, 80 millimoles make 1 milligram. That is the calculation for converting milligram of glucose into millimoles. So, milligram divided by 18 is the value for millimoles of blood sugar. Similarly, 1 milligram of bilirubin is equal to 17 millimoles, only 1 millimole less than that. So, if somebody asks you what is the value in millimole of bilirubin, whatever bilirubin value you have divided by 17 is a millimole in value. So, what are the differences between pre or intra hepatic or post hepatic jaundice? How to differentiate these three conditions? What if it is pre hepatic, uh -huh. indirect bilirubin levels will be there. Uh, unconjugated or indirect bilirubin will be there. Very good. Then hepatic. In hepatic, both it can be. Uh, it can be indirect. a mixture of both. Uh, uh, indirect and direct post hepatic mostly it will be direct bilirubin. direct or conjugated bilirubin okay but other features are also there so serum bilirubin conjugated if you check it will be mostly unconjugated in prehepatic it will be a combination of conjugated and unconjugated and post hepatic it will be mostly conjugated bilirubin that is the first and foremost then if you check the urobilinogen which is the bilinogen going through the urine. Urine urobilinogen will be positive in prehepatic. It will be negative in post-hepatic. It may be positive in hepatic jaundice. And if you see urine bile salts, it will be absent in prehepatic. It may be positive in post-hepatic and hepatic jaundice. And urine bilirubin will be negative. Whereas it will be positive, highly colored in post hepatic. So you will have almost what is called dark colored urine and clay colored stools. That is a classic description of post hepatic or obstructive jaundice. Very high colored because of the high presence of urobilin. And fecal sarcobilinogen will be very much increased in prehepatic. And if it is absent or clay colored, that will be characteristic of post-hepatic and in uh, hepatic or hepatitis or intrahepatic jaundice it may be normal or decreased and fecal fat will be normal uh, in uh, prehepatic and hepatic it may be very much raised because the fat is not absorbed properly it may be very high fat content may be there in post-hepatic because of the absence of bile and the enzymes will be very high in prehepatic because it is mostly uh, load on that and it will be 50 to 100 intranational units in hepatic and alkaline phosphatase will be normal whereas this enzyme will be very much elevated in post hepatic so these three things high colored urine clay colored stools and high values of alkaline phosphatase and increase in conjugated bilirubin are the four things you have to remember for post hepatic or obstructive jaundice. And plasma albumin may be normal, decreased, depending. This is a synthetic function which will in the long term get uh, affected. And prothrombin time will be definitely normal in prehepatic, but it will be elevated in both hepatic and post hepatic jaundice. So, describe the pathophysiology of obstructive jaundice. How obstructive jaundice happens? This pathophysiology you can describe like this. Whenever there is an increase in biliary pressure, because the bile is not able to flow, what happens? The biliary calaniculi, which are supposed to carry the bile, secreted bile, they are not able to take it forward. So there is an increase in the biliary pressure, and that will lead to First thing, disruption of tight junctions between hepatocytes and bile duct cells with increased permeability. Already hepatocytes, you know, they are, uh, the sinusoids have got very loose junctions, which we saw in the last class, but hepatocytes are normally placed in uh, 
row with a tight junction and that is disrupted and bile the duct cells bile in a biliary canaliculi and duct cells are also uh, disrupted and so they start leaking the bile from the intra canalicular region into the uh, extra extravasation start happening and this reflux bile contents enter the liver sinusoids normally it is not supposed to mix with the blood in the liver and that's why in that uh, uh, histology picture we saw in the last class blood is flowing in one direction and bile is flowing in the opposite direction so that should be the normal arrangement but when it comes out of all the ducts and the canaliculi where it has to be going it mixes with the liver sinusoid then this stimulates neutrophil infiltration which increases the fibrogenesis and deposition of reticulin fibers in the portal triad so the, because of the bile leak into the liver sinusoids the liver starts and the blood starts producing more neutrophil infiltration and the reticulin fibers get converted into collagen type 1 collagen and this laying down of collagen fibers leads to hepatic fibrosis obstruction of sinusoids and secondary biliary cirrhosis and portal hypertension and the fibrosis can also lead to atrophy of the obstructed liver so just similar whereas in the uh, cirrhosis it is mainly by the eta cells of the sinusoids uh, which are stimulated to produce these changes ultimately to produce a cirrhotic condition you have to have more type 1 collagen and shrink the whole liver that is the final pathology but the main stimulus for that in cirrhosis of alcoholic or nutritional is the stimulation from the sinusoidal lining eta cells whereas here it is from the neutrophil infiltration because of the reflux in the bite so that is the small pathological uh, difference in pathophysiology which i thought you have to know now what is the physiology of obstruction to bile flow of course normal secretory pressure of bile is about 15 to 25 cm of water at 35 cm of water there is suppression of bile flow and high pressure leads to cholangio venous and cholangio lymphatic reflex of bile what i described in the earlier slide and dilatation of bile duct and intrahepatic biliary radicals occur intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation and this dilatation may be absent if there is secondary hepatic fibrosis or cirrhosis so many a times patients with cirrhosis of alcoholic or nutritional they do not commonly exhibit uh, jaundice because their uh, hepatociliary uh, tree is completely obstructed they don't um, i mean crush so they don't even uh, have the time to cause the reflex and all those things so the dilatation is seen mainly in the intrahepatic biliary radicals whereas that may not be present if already fibrosis has started the uh, process what are the effects of increase in biliary pressure so normal pressure i told you it is about 15 to 25 cm and from 35 cm of water pressure there is a suppression of flow so when the biliary pressure increases what will happen disruption of tight junctions what i showed you in the earlier slide we have and bile ducts also will increase permeability reflux of bile contents into liver sinusoid neutrophil infiltration and reticulin fiber formation the same changes that happen are described again here laying down the collagen fibers to cause obstruction and ultimately fibrosis or atrophy can happen okay. so what changes occur in the liver blood flow secondary to obstruction of bile flow initially the bile only gets obstructed but will it ultimately cause a change in the liver blood flow also that also happens that can be happening in two ways one is acute obstruction where increase in hepatic arterial blood flow will happen to compensate for this or there will be no change in uh, there will be increase in hepatic arterial flow but there will be no change in 
portal venous blood flow. That will happen if there is an acute obstruction. For example, if a patient who had a gallbladder stone, that stone migrates and comes into the common bile duct and blocks. That will result in an acute obstruction. In that situation, what the body will do is to increase the hepatic arterial blood flow to maintain the liver oxygenation and uh, survival. And there will be not any change in the portal venous blood flow. Whereas if it is a chronic obstruction, for example, a patient with a CA pancreas, gradually the ampulla vetter gets uh, uh, occluded. Then it will not occur overnight. It will occur in a gradual fashion. So in chronic obstruction, there will be a total decrease in liver blood flow. There will be dilatation of sinusoids and elevation of portal pressure. So the main difference, if the portal venous pressure is normal, it is an acute obstruction. If the portal pressure has increased, it is a chronic obstruction. This is the point you have to remember. So due to the changes in the bile flow, these two changes in the blood flow can happen. And the difference is between acute and chronic uh, is better understood. What are effects of renal system in the obstructive jaundice? Same like what we saw in the cirrhosis. The same things can happen for the renal system also. So can you recollect what you learned in the earlier discussion? What is, how is the re renal system affected in patients with liver disease? Whether it is cirrhosis or obstructive jaundice. What is that syndrome called? Hepatorenal syndrome. Ah, hepatorenal syndrome. Okay. So patients with uh, obstructive jaundice also can develop the same renal failure problem. 10% incidence with 70% mortality. Factors uh, which are responsible for renal failure are there may be decreased cardiac function because the bile decreases the cardiac contract the serious effects we saw in the last class and increase in the levels of uh, atrial natriuretic peptide resulting in hypovolemia decrease the effect of bile salts on kidney mediated by increased prostaglandin e2 affecting the uh, inner medullary blood flow and also endotoxemia because bile is not going to the intestines there may be toxins absorbed from the intestine leading to endotoxemia. All these things can result in renal vasoconstriction, stunting of blood from cortex, activation of complement system of the peritubular and globular uh, fibrin, uh, fibrin deposition leading to tubular and cortical necrosis. So all these changes can happen. Then how is the immune system affected in patients with jaundice? They are more prone for any infection. Their total immunity is affected. Any idea how the immune system can get affected? That is because there is a defect in cellular immunity. In fact, T cell production happens. There is a decreased neutrophil chemotaxic ability and defective bacterial phagocytosis and depressed function of reticular endothelial system, especially the Cooper cells in the sinusoids. We saw that is the major macrophage, which is going to absorb the toxins and bacteria and protect the liver. So that function of the Cooper cells is decreased and uh, the bacterial phagocytic action is also impaired with and the neutrophil chemotaxis is also gradually removed. Even though it is the first stimulus to cause that uh, changes, gradually the neutrophil uh, uh, attraction will be reduced and T-cell proliferation also will be reduced. All these things will make the patient more susceptible with the reduced immunity for any extraneous infection. So they can easily go in for any septicemia. What happens to coagulation in obstructive jaundice? This is a very easy question to answer. All of you, if you know how the clotting factors work, then it is easy to describe this question, answer for this question. What is important for absorption of uh, fat soluble vitamins? Vitamin K, sir. Vitamin K. Mm. Bile salt? Is bile, is not, uh, bile is very important, isn't it? Fat soluble okay. vitamin K. Uh, so, when there is no bile flow, this uh, 
prolongation of prothrombin time due to loss of calcium endotoxin induced damage to factor 11 and 12 platelets low grade dac which increases fibrin and thrombocytopenia from hypersplenism and decreased absorption of fat soluble vitamin a d e and k all the four vitamins are not absorbed and especially vitamin k when it is not absorbed what is the role of vitamin k why that has to be absorbed in the blood what exactly is the chemical or the change that it uh, vitamin k produces in the clotting factor produces what is called gamma carboxyl carboxylation okay the gamma position of that uh, structure of the clotting factor is carboxylate so gamma carboxylation is has to take place to activate the all of you know that coagulant factor factors are all in an inactive or idle mode when the coagulation has to happen they have to be converted from the inactive state to an active state that will be maintained then only by vitamin k causing this change in what is called gamma carboxylation so the gamma carboxylation is important to make the clotting factors to become active from inactive state that is why if you see the coagulation profile you will be finding the word or the symbol a along with the factor 9 will be initially factor 9 it will become factor 9a factor 10 will become factor 10a factor 11 will become factor 11a so the a means it is an activated fact form so that activation takes place only with the uh, presence of vitamin k so when vitamin k is not absorbed because of the absence of bile in the intestine then patient will not get the activation done so this will lead to prolongation in the bleeding so clotting factors function is disrupted that is why we have to always supplement vitamin k parenterally because it is not absorbed from the intestine so always require at least 3 days of treatment with vitamin k for patients with obstructive jaundice to have a, a normal coagulation profile then what happens to wound healing in patients with jaundice will it be normal or will it be impaired there will be delayed yeah. wound healing uh, delayed wound healing high incidence of wound dehiscence and uh, this is because of the activity of enzyme propyl hydroxylase in the skin this helps to incorporation of proline in the collagen so defective synthesis of collagen takes place so what happens the wound healing is also affected so any patient with uh, obstructive jaundice undergoing a laparotomy or any emergency surgery they have to be very careful that there they you can expect delayed wound healing good dehiscence in them and what is the mechanism of hyperbilirubinemia in obstructive jaundice patients develop increase in bilirubin level we saw the difference between pre hepatic and post hepatic pre intra and post hepatic conditions so what is the mechanism of hyperbilirubinemia how does the bilirubin rise in obstructive jaundice that mechanism is there is a rise by 25 to 43 micromole per liter per day the mechanism is there is a biliary venous and biliary regurgitation of conjugated bile due to disruption of tight and intracellular junction already we told you the intracellular tight junction between hepatocytes and the biliary the canaliculi and biliary duct they all uh, get separated the tight junction is lost so transhepatic regurgitation due to reversal of the secretory polarity of the hepatocytes and rupture of dilated canaliculi into sinusoid directly due to necrosis of hepatocytes these are the mechanisms of why bile or bilirubin is able to enter the blood in the sinusoids and through that it will be carried to the system in circulation now what are the types of biliary obstruction again that can be complete obstruction whether it is intrahepatic or extrahepatic 
Relief abstraction need not be all the time total. It can be complete abstraction as you get in a, a st um, large stone obstructing the common bile duct. That means uh, that is both the hepatic duct and the cystic duct when they join and then before they enter the uh, second part of the duodenum, it is called the common bile duct. So common bile duct obstruction produces complete obstruction or it can be a small stone migrating and then going back uh, producing intermittent obstruction or it can be chronic incomplete obstruction like a growth which is partially obstructing or it may be segmental obstruction inside the liver. So there are four types of biliary obstruction. So what is the clinical importance of this? Why should we know these types of obstruction? Anybody can you just logically think an answer for this? What will be the clinical picture in a patient with com complete obstruction? What will be the clinical picture in intermittent obstruction? And what will be the picture in uh, chronic, incomplete, and segmental obstructions? In complete obstruction, what will happen to the type of uh, intensity of jaundice? That is, yellow discoloration. Will it become more and more, or will it be very mild? Severe, sir. Complete severe. Ah, patient will have very intense jaundice. The uh, bilirubin level will shoot up more than six milligram also. Because uh, that is the reason why I told you at three milligram only the sclera gets uh, yellowish, six milligram mucous membrane and skin. But in a complete obstruction, the bilirubin may go up to thirty or forty. So uh, the entire uh, structures in the body will become yellowish. So it will be very intense obstruction, a very intense jaundice. Whereas in intermittent obstruction, a small stone coming and blocking the passage and then it gets uh, moved out and goes into the intestine. So patient may have jaundice for a few days, then resolve completely, then again get back the jaundice. So it will not be a very intense jaundice. It will be waxing and waning type. Jaundice may look very severe one day, the other day it may look very mild when the stone moves out. So in intermittent jaundice, it will be waxing and waning. Whereas chronic in incomplete obstruction, you will find it will be a steady uh, jaundice. It will neither become too intense nor disappear. It will be a steady jaundice. And segmental obstruction, it will be very, very mild. That means only one small portion of the liver is affected or a biliary tree is affected and it will produce a very, very mild type of jaundice, okay? So from the type and intensity of the jaundice, we can, to some extent, guess where exactly or how, what type of obstruction is taking place. What investigations are helpful in obstructive jaundice? Supposing a patient with obstructive jaundice comes for free anesthetic assessment, what are the investigations you will ask for? More or less the same like what you do for a hepatic evaluation in cirrhosis or common decompensated de liver disease. You have to recollect the same answers. Because Complete hemogram, renal function test, liver function test, hmm. yeah, uh, USG same. abdomen, fibro scan. Yeah, so this is the most important first thing is to diagnose you must have the alkaline phosphatase. Okay, alkaline phosphatase gets uh, enormously elevated. So that is the first uh, sensitive indicator. And what are the factors responsible are the biliary component of regurgitation and the increased hepatic synthesis of this enzyme. Then the other aids are you can do an ultrasound to determine the presence of intra or hepatic uh, biliary dilatation. More uh, than ultrasound, CT scan will definitely help you to detect a gallstone and CT is very useful in obese and excessive bowel gas stages and the patients where you cannot make a good ultrasound study and it can also assess the stage and the probability of any tumor present in the uh, pancreas or other areas and the ERCT allows for biopsy, breast cytology, and it can sometimes be therapeutic by doing a sphincterotomy or a removal of the stone or a, putting a stent, picture dilatation, all these things can be done by ERCT. 
and the transcutaneous cholangiography, percutaneous transfer, uh, 22 Chiba needles allowed to allow the biliary drainage as well as stenting can be done. So these are the investigative details apart from the regular what investigations you told for regular assessment of liver function also will be useful in these cases as a partly therapeutic as well as for diagnosis. That is EUS also, that is endoscopic ultrasound is also very useful in these cases to locate uh, stones or strictures which are not di diagnosed from the transabdominal ultrasound. What are the various shades of yellow color in jaundice? How does it help in identifying the tap? This is a question I asked you earlier. And uh, these are the three shades you have to remember. One is called the lemon yellow shade. You can see the color in this eye, clearer. Usually mild jaundice, usually seen in hemolytic jaundice, where usual bilirubin is less than six milligram. And orange yellow <coughs> shade hepatocellular jaundice because it is a combination of both uh, conjugated and unconjugated. Uh, usually in deep jaundice with mixed conjugated and unconjugated, it is, a, it is described as orange yellow. Then greenish yellow, which is a long-standing deep jaundice, usually in obstructive jaundice. So patients who have a, you can see even the skin in the, between the eye is also looking yellowish here. So that much of uh, severity will be there in obstructive jaundice. So lemon yellow, hepatitis, orange yellow, I mean uh, prehepatic or hemolytic, orange yellow, hepatocellular, and greenish yellow, obstructive jaundice. Greenishness due to conversion of bilirubin into biliverdin. That is the reason why the shade becomes slightly greenish also. Okay. So this picture will have to... Keep you reminded about the various shades when you examine a patient with jaundice. You are better to identify what the exact shade is so that you can get a clue to the pathology that is happening. What are various surgeries based on the pathology? Sometimes, you know, patients with obstructive jaundice, you need to give anesthesia for the curation or curative therapy for the obstruction, like the removal. Whipple's disease, uh, Whipple's procedure for uh, head of the pancreas uh, carcinoma, which a patient may have obstructive jaundice, or patients with uh, ductal stones, you may have to do a cholidoco uh, cystostomy and, uh, and insert the bile duct in the different location. So, various types of surgeries can be done. So, you can Two cholidocolithiasis by ERCP or CBD exploration or bilioentric anastomosis, cholangiocarcinoma, liver resection and local excision of the lesion, or Whipple procedure for uh, periantillary carcinoma, or biliary structure, you may know to do hepatoco, jejunostomy or liver resection, and chronic pancreatitis with head mass, you may do a vicul or a bilioentric anastomosis. So these are all some of the surgical or endoscopic procedures where you may need to give anesthesia for these patients. Now there is a picture shown here, and uh, what are its advantages? We are seeing a picture of some commercial preparation and if you read that, it will have your answer also. It's a carbohydrate drink which can ah. be given even one hour prior to surgery to... Yes, so it is one of the important pre-anesthetic preparations. You can give this uh, carbohydrate drink for patients before surgery to... Uh, as a regular uh, feed to prevent the uh, so instead of uh, we normally starve the patient six hours four hours two hours is the usual guideline but this preparation can be given even one hour earlier so that the patient will not become hypoglycemic clear carbohydrate thing for preoperative surgical patient which is a lemon -lum. So gastric secretion volume and pH not substantially different in this case. This is given. So there is no risk of any aspiration or any uh, uh, 
increase in the volume so the patient will not have uh, aspiration problem so it can be safely given at the same time you can also reduce the thirst hunger and fatigue for the patient and it also reduces insulin resistance so these are the three advantages for which this is specifically given for patients with liver disorder coming for surgery so what is the anesthetic management of these surgery patients when they have obstructive jaundice and they are coming for any surgical procedure what are the basics of anesthetic management what are the goals which we saw in the last class it's more or less the same thing only so anesthetic management principles are the same for any dcld patients so you have to maintain the uh, hepatic blood flow you should not precipitate any acute liver failure and you must uh, make sure that all the drugs which are metabolized and eliminated via the liver are kept with to the minimal level and you must uh, maintain adequate renal perfusion and maintain uh, renal function you must know that uh, the cardiovascular changes which can be caused by the excessive bilirubin depressing the myocardium and producing a decrease in hcr so you have to maintain normovolemia and normotension maintain hemodynamic stability <laughs> and uh, mainly take care of the coagulation profile these patients have to be evaluated a thromboelastogram uh, at the bedside will tell you about the coagulation profile and take care of all these things so whatever you have learned in the earlier discussion of management of uh, dcld patient the same principles only apply for patients with obstructive jaundice also now i am showing you two diagrams which show some surgical procedures can you name these procedures you can see this is the uh, hepatic duct combining with uh, cystic duct very common bile duct and you find there is an anastomosis is done here okay and uh, so instead of uh, going to the duodenum it is anastomosis to the first part of the duodenum and so the second part and here it is allowed to continue with the pancreatic duct so the common bile duct and pancreatic duct combine and then they open at the ampulla of wetter the second part of the duodenum if you remember your basic anatomy so there are two modifications done here what is this procedure called polydoco duodenostomy okay so polydoco means the bile duct polydoco duodenostomy so they rep reposition the uh, uh, bile duct insertion into the duodenum at a different level so in this first picture if you see they have uh, cut off this here joining with the pancreatic duct and made the common bile duct in the, what is called the end to side anastomosis to the duodenum and whereas here they maintain the continuity but make a Uh, side to side anastomosis between the posterior part of the duodenum and the common bile duct so this procedure is called polydoco duodenostomy what are these incisions made for this one is a midline upper abdominal midline incision this is a incision in the hepatic semi this is mainly for whipple's procedure that is the resection of the pancreas and the part of the duodenum bile duct all that so things that are done in whipple's procedure before the surgery you have the tumor here and you have the tail of the pancreas you have the gall bladder you have the bile duct so they ligate the common bile i mean uh, hepatic duct here and then remove the gall bladder bring the hepatic duct and the anastomosis to the duodenum and also tail of the pancreas has to be anastomosed here and the stomach is anastomosed to the small intestine directly so all these structures which are in this color is what you call gray color 
they are all removed and the, the anastomosis is done so this is just for you to know those of you who are uh, anesthetizing patients for uh, pa pancreas you must know how these procedures are done complicated and long time taking procedures and this is another way of uh, doing the incision for the reverse bucket handle bucket handle incision for the same procedure so these are the points that i just wanted to uh, you to know about obstructive jaundice uh, now we go to the next topic hepatitis b and anesthesiologist okay so what are the different types of viruses which can affect the liver all of you are quite aware what are all the different types of hepatitis virus hepatitis alphabetically you know a b c b e there are so many a uh, e f up to g you have okay. hepatitis a which was uh, diagnosed in 73 hepatitis b hepatitis c d e f not separate entity but a mutant of b virus and hepatitis g which has been diagnosed uh, in 1995 okay so the hcv stands for hepatitis a virus hcv stands for hepatitis b like that all the variant is given here the h and v are hepatitis virus so that is how it is written in short form in what way hepatitis b virus is different from others it's a dna virus dna virus very good very good it's a dna virus and uh, it is classified like this all these are rna virus except the hepatitis b which is a dna virus and the virus hepatitis classified into acute hepatitis which is self limiting uh, liver injury less than 6 months of the duration or it can be a chronic hepatitis hepatic inflammation of more than 6 months so viral hepatitis classified as acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis and hepatitis b is a dna virus all the other viruses are rna virus so that is a very important difference what are the characteristics of hpv infection that is hepatitis b infection how is it uh, transmitted what is its uh, Uh, prodromal period or incubation period what will be the change in the uh, antibody type what will be the prognosis so if you see that the severe pathological consequences of persistent hepatitis b infection include development of chronic hepatic insufficiency so only hepatitis a which is self limiting and which will resolve completely the hepatitis b is a risky infection it can linger on for a long time and it can result in cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma also and in addition carries carriers can transmit the disease for many years so if any person has been infected with hpv that is why we always check the blood before transmission the blood bank people check for hepatitis b antigens in the blood and uh, then only certify that it is checked for hiv hepatitis b all communicable or transmittable diseases can still happen and uh, the virus interferes with the functions of the liver while replicating in hepatocytes once the virus enters the liver it goes and replicates itself in the hepatocytes the immune system is then activated to produce a specific reaction to combat and possibly eradicate the infection agents as a consequence pathological damage the liver becomes inflamed that is how the inflammatory process happens now the importance of structure of hepatitis b you see this is the hepatitis b virus structure you can see there is a lipid bilayer like all other cells and uh, this is the dna which is there and there is a three antigens one is a <coughs> surface antigen large surface protein antigen it says it's vsag this is what we normally look for in any patient then there is a uh, core antigen 
HPCAG and there is a E antigen inside the cell. So there are three types of antigen in these and uh, this is the cut section. So you have a HPSAG surface core protein, HPC inner core protein and HPE is a secreted protein. So three different proteins are there and there is a DNA polymerase, DNA mostly double stranded with 230 EP. And core antigen is there and protein kinase. So these are the things that are there uh, for this infection. So how does the virus replicate in the host? This is a little complicated process, how it goes and attaches itself. I'll show you it in the picture. The first thing is virus attaches to the liver cell membrane, that is the hepatocyte. This is the single hepatocyte which has been enlarged. This is the nucleus. So the virus gets attached to the membrane of the hepatocyte, first stage. And in the second stage, it is transported into the liver by forming a sac endostosis. So it uh, produces a sac and then you can see it uh, uh, gets isolated and then comes and attacks the nucleus of the hepatocyte. So once uh, the, the virus is transplanted into the liver cell, the core particle then releases its content of DNA and DNA polymerase into the liver cell nucleus. And once within the cell nucleus, hepatitis B DNA causes the liver cell to produce via messenger RNA, HBS protein, HPC protein, DNA polymerase and HPE protein and other undetected proteins and enzymes. And DNA polymerase causes the liver cell to make copies of the hepatitis B DNA from messenger RNA. So it starts replicating inside. Once it uh, gets access into the nucleus, uses our own cell multiplication mechanism of MNA, uh, messenger RNA and the DNA and starts producing its own DNA and starts multiplicating. And the cell then assembles live copies of the virus. And you can see here, the assembly has taken and new viruses have been formed. So all these things are utilized. And the, because of the excess number of surface proteins produced, many of these are stick together to form small spheres and chains. And this can give rise to characteristic ground glass appearance of the blood sample seen under microscope. So they all stick together. And then these copies of virus excess surface antigen are released from the liver cell membrane into the bloodstream and from there it can infect the other liver cells. So from one liver cell it can multiply and get released and go on to attack all other cells. So this is the final picture that you can see how it is uh, entering the core coming into the <coughs> nucleus forming transcription getting outside forming multiple and then trying to come out the uh, antigen as well as the uh, virus. So what is the mode of transmission for this? HP, hepatitis B, is it a fecal or a parenteral transmission? Through the body fluids, sir. Ah, it's a parenteral transmission. It, it is not, whereas hepatitis A is a speco oral. It is mainly contaminated in the food, enters the digestive tract, and then you get hepatitis A. Whereas hepatitis B is mainly modes of sexual. Sexual workers and homosexuals are at risk. Parenteral IV drugs or health workers are increased risk. Perinatal, mothers who are HPE AG positive are much more likely to transmit to the offspring and perinatal transmission is the main means of transmission of high prevalence in population. And also, of course, uh, any, uh, as you said, fluids handling or uh, um, contaminated uh, blood transfusion, all these things or the uh, usage of uh, um, uh, drug abuse by intravenous, uh, same needle and syringe used by several people. All these things are the mode of IV administration, parental. The second one is uh, IV drug administration. And who are the high risk group for infection? Sexual workers, medical workers, 
Excellent. Very good. The people from endemic areas, babies of mothers with chronic hepatitis B, intravenous drug abusers, people with multiple sex partners, hemodialysis patients. Renal, that is why all patients who are started on hemodialysis, they will be administered hepatitis B vaccine immediately before the first dialysis itself because that's one of the common routes where they can get. Healthcare personnel who have contact with blood are residents and staff members of institutions for the mentally retarded because these, these mentally retarded people when they become aggressive, they can bite, they can cause injury and if they are already a carrier, they can transmit it easily. So these are all the high risk groups who are vulnerable to get the hepatitis B vaccine. Describe the three antigen antibody system of hepatitis B infection. There are three antigen antibody systems. Because you know that already we have seen um, three proteins that are present there. Isn't it? So yes, you can sir. have HBS AG anti HBS system. That is the surface antigen. The first of them is the surface antigen, which is called HBS AG. Hepatitis B surface antigen. That is the expansion for HPS AG. This appears one to two weeks or up to even 12 weeks after exposure, persists for one to six weeks in acute hepatitis B. In chronic patients or carrier, it can present for many, many years. So if you suspect anybody who had an infection long back and when you want to find out if they are a carrier, you have to check their blood for the HPS AG and not the antibody. So you have to find out if their HPS AG levels are very high, then the, it is a marker of infectivity. So HPS AG can be found in blood and secretion, saliva, urine, cement, tears, sweat and breath milk. Whereas anti-HPS appear after HPS AG disappear several weeks or months after anti-HPS is positive, protective antibody and can persist for many years. So if anybody has got antibodies against this uh, surface protein antigen, that means they have already got their own antibody level so that they can protect themselves. So whenever you want to administer a vaccine, you must always check the antibody level in that person, whether it is required or not. If they have already formed their own antibody, they will have their protection against the antigen. So you don't have to unnecessarily vaccinate them. That is the main reason for finding out the antibody level. The second is the HBC core antigen and its antisystem. And this core antigen is found in the nuclei of the liver cells and it is uh, no uh, not free in the serum. You cannot find it from the blood. And this core antigen is a marker of replication of hepatitis B. It is not a marker of uh, infection or the severity. It is a marker of replication. The stage called window phase where you will not be seeing any of this. And anti-HPC immunoglobulin M is a marker of acute infection and acute attack. So only way to find out whether this HBC is there is to find out the immunoglobin M level against this HBC core, which is a chronic infection. And the anti-HBC IG is a marker of fast infection. So always IgM is a marker of acute infection in any virus and IgG will be a marker of infection of chronic or a post-infection or a long-term infection before that. Then the third category is the e secreted protein, HBEAG. It's a soluble antigen. It's a reliable indicator of active replication and the anti hb marker is a reduced infectivity. So if you have antibodies against this E, that means that patient is not a highly infective person. If it exists long, it may be a marker of integration of HB into liver cell also. So of this, this is the most important. We always check for HPS AG, antigen level and antibody level. So what are the signs and symptoms of hepatitis B infection? What will be the patient be displaying when they have this or when they develop this? Supposing somebody gets infected with hepatitis B, 
So the symptoms will be fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, dark colored urine, clay colored stools sometimes, like just like obstructive jaundice, joint pain, and uh, jaundice hepatomegaly. All these things can happen. What is the clinical outcome? How all a hepatitis B vaccine can, I mean, infection can lead to? Is it a completely resolving like hepatitis A or can it be lingering? We have already seen what are all things that can happen, isn't it? It will lead to cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma, but because of immunization, incidence mm. has reduced. Okay. So if it becomes an acute hepatitis B infection, 90% resolve. 90% of the patients will resolve it from that. 9% will form or have HPV's antigen for more than six months. And only 1% will go for what is called fulminant hepatitis. Okay, so these are the three major manifestations or prognosis that will happen. One, 90% of the time, patients will completely uh, become normal. 9% will continue to carry the antigen. There will be people who are carriers who can infect other people. And 1% may go in for acute fulminant hepatitis and die. Okay? And once they become carriers with a positive HBSAG antigen, 50% may resolve after six months. And uh, some of them may be totally asymptomatic carriers. And some of them will become chronic persistent hepatitis. They will have some amount of jaundice all the time. And or some of them have active hepatitis itself. So mild chronic state, active chronic state can happen. If it is a mild chronic state, they can develop extra hepatic diseases like polyarthritis nodosum or glomerulonephritis. Whereas if it is a chronic active hepatitis, they can go for cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, so these are all the so first thing we must find out always after a patient had an hepatitis B virus infection, must find out whether the antigen is still positive or not. If good antibody level has formed, that means patient has himself protected his uh, liver damage. Whereas if the antigen is still persistent, he is called a carrier. And that person needs to be uh, identified for these four things that can happen. 50% of them will recover. Some of them will be asymptomatic and will be a carrier for a longer time. Some of them will have chronic states in a milder form or an active form. And the active form people are likely to go for cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. This is the ultimate outcome. What are the diagnostic tests to find the various stages of hepatitis B virus infection? From what we learned earlier about the three types of antigen antibody reaction, we should be able to answer this question. So, if FTSAG antigen is used as a general marker of infection, okay? And this AB means antibody, HBS AB, antibody used to document recovery and immunity to HBS uh, B infection. If the patient has anti HBC immunoglobulin, it's a marker of acute infection, IgM. Anti HBC IgG is a marker of chronic infection. And HPE AG presence antigen against the E protein indicates active replication of virus and therefore infectiveness. So HBE antigen patient also will be infective. HBSAG patient also will be, is still having an infection and also it can be an in, infect other people. And have the HBE virus no longer replicating, that means if you have patient has developed antibody against this E antigen, it means the virus is no longer replicating. However, the patient can still be positive for HPSAG, which is made by integrate H, uh, integrated virus uh, HPV infection. And the hepatitis B DNA combination indicates active replication of virus more accurate than HPE antigen, especially in cases of escape mutants, used mainly for monitoring response to therapy as a method of assessing whether there is a continuing infection or not. 
Then coming to the next point of needle stick injury. This asked as a theory question in some of the exams uh, earlier. What is a needle stick injury? How can you define this as a needle? Definition of needle stick injury. Any injury by a sharp object. Needle stick injury is a percutaneous piercing wound, typically set by a needle point and possibly by other sharp instruments or objects also. Okay, that is called the needle stick injury. Even though the word needle is used there, it need not be always needle. It can be a uh, uh, 11 blade knife, a uh, blade, okay, or any sharp uh, needle used by the surgeon, surgical incision when you try to suture a wound in the uh, casualty, you can get hurt. So, not only the hypodermic needle, it can be any sharp instrument. In which locations sharp injuries happen? In which locations? Mostly in the, the hand and fingers. Uh, that is, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, question is a little confusing. Locations uh, in the hospital or in the clinical areas. I'm not asking about the locations in the body or the sites in the body. So, majority happen in patient room, inpatient medical ICUs, operating room, outpatient, emergency recovery room, or laboratory and other areas. So the maximum occurs in patient room and the patient is an inpatient, especially in ICU, the maximum uh, injuries happen to pay, uh, healthcare workers only in the patient room. The next commonest area is operating room. You must have seen many surgeons uh, try to take a bite, getting uh, injured by themselves immediately, removing the glove and trying to put uh, some script and all that. Then outpatient department, Emergency room, 8% people. And labs, when you try to take a sample, those people can get the by others, 15, 13%. What devices are involved in the sharp injuries? Already we have seen the above. It not, uh, need not be always hypodermic needle. It can be disposable syringes. Six devices account for 78%. Disposable syringes 30%, sutured needles 20%, tinged steel needles 12%, intravenous catheter fillets 5%, phlebotomy needles 3%, and scalpels 8%. So these are the various percentages of instruments which cause that. When do sharp injuries occur? What is the time or what? how does it happen? The majority occur in healthcare workers when they try to dispose the needles, administer injections, or try to draw blood, or recap the needles. Nowadays, all the all of you know that the disposable needles come with a syringes come with a cap. So when you try to replace the cap and keep the needle, that is the time you can get hurt. Or when you handle trash or dirty linen. The healthcare worker, bad boys, when they try to handle trash or that you know, that is the time they can get. So, how is needle stick injury managed? How to do that management? Any idea? So, we have to wash it with the running water. Hmm. We have to inform the. Hmm. Thank you, you are right. Hmm. But more than all these things, anything has to be taken care of. Not to panic. Okay. First and foremost is not to panic or put the finger in the mouth or squeeze the wound out of to take the blood out. This should not be done. Majority of the people will say, squeeze it and uh, take out the blood. All the infection will go. No, that's not there. Or don't put your finger in the mouth and try to suck out the blood. Immediately wash the wound and surrounding skin with soap and water and rinse it. Not just plain water, but put some soap and water and rinse. Do not scrub or use bleach or chlorine, alcohol, betadine, iodine, antiseptics, detergents, or any antibiotics on the wound. So do not do all these things. Enumerate the steps following occupational exposure to needle stick injury. The steps are crisis management. Remain calm, don't panic, dispose the sharp appropriately, 
first aid wash and irrigate the site report to the appropriate authority get evaluated for uh, possible uh, uh, exposure to this thing baseline testing for hiv uh, post exposure prophylaxis pep stands for post exposure prophylaxis hiv infection hepatitis c hbsag these three by uh, two all these things are uh, uh, very serious infections which has to be ruled out and the prophylaxis should be started within two hours of exposure but not later than three days 72 hours within 72 hours you must do the uh, post uh, exposure prophylaxis and uh, any treatment has to be taken for four weeks 28 days and follow up for HIV testing at six weeks, three months, and six months. And follow up counseling and care. And inform doctor if the healthcare worker is a pregnant lady or feeding a child, breastfeeding a child. It has to be informed because that can be transmitted to the offspring also. What immediate measures to do following exposure to injury? Again, uh, some of them will be repetition wash with soap and water mucous membrane if it is mucous membrane flush exposed membrane with water if it is a open wound irrigate with sterile saline or antiseptic solution if it is eyes irrigate with clean water saline or sterile eye irrigants if it is mouth do not swallow rinse out several times with cold water again remain calm do not panic these are the advice given again and again what are the do's and don'ts after exposure what you can do is remove the gloves. If you are wearing a gloves and you've got the injury, remove the gloves if appropriate. Wash the exposed thoroughly with running water and soap. Irrigate with water or saline if it is eyes or mouth. Wash skin with soap and water. Don't do, do not panic. Do not put prick finger into the mouth. Do not squeeze the wound. Do not use bleach, chlorine or alcohol and all those things. What standard precautions to be followed? Whenever you have a needle stick injury, these are the precautions that they say. It is barriers protection, hand washing, safe technique, safe handling of sharp items, specimens, spill blood and body fluids. All these things to be uh, disposed in a proper way. And the use of disposable sterile items as far as possible. And then what is one-handed scoop technique? This is for the uh, replacing the cap of uh, the needle. So instead of uh, many times the needle stick injury occurs when you try to use both your hands and try to refit the cap. Many of the times you would have seen in theater when you try to put it mistakenly, you get a hurt in your finger and the needle does not go into the cap at all. So this is what is called the one-handed scoop technique where you first insert the needle with the cap on the uh, solid surface and then try to uh, lift it and uh, bring it as low as possible and then use your thumb and finger to snap it to close. So this, in this way you will not get hurt. So this is a safe method to replace the cap of the needle which is called one-handed scoop technique. And what are the immediate steps to follow after needle stick injury? Report to the casualty medical officer. Promptly notify your supervisor. Fill out the needle stick injury form. This is a very, very seriously taken thing in uh, all the Western countries, especially UK. They are very, very strict because uh, they don't want any health worker to suffer any late consequences of needle stick injury. So if it has happened, you have to do all this uh, reporting. <laughs> What are the good and bad of vaccination of healthcare professionals against this problem? The good news is the healthcare professionals who have been vaccinated, the vaccine offers virtually complete protection to responders. And hence all healthcare protectors should be uh, vaccinated against hepatitis B. But the bad news is most health, healthcare workers are not vaccinated. Most of them, even if you take uh, how many of you in this uh, class, how many of you had a hepatitis B vaccination done? I think majority Mostly we all had it. Are you all had it? Very good. So 60% yes. of vaccines do not develop antibody also. That is the bad news. And repeat vaccine series, 30 to 50% respond. 
and really bad news is central disease committee estimates 50 to 75 healthcare workers die from hepatitis b every year so it is a very serious thing all of you should be aware of this what are the post exposure prophylaxis these are the things by definition it is a comprehensive management given to minimize the risk of infection following potential exposure to blood borne pathogens like hiv hepatitis b and c this includes counseling risk assessment relevant laboratory investigations based on informed consent of the source and the exposed person first aid and depending on the risk assessment provide the short term antiviral antiretroviral drugs with the follow up and support so these are the things that we have to do what is the post exposure algorithm for vaccinated versus unvaccinated healthcare workers so if the patient is exposed to hepatitis b and uh, already he has uh, is vaccinated then check the antibody level if the antibody level is more than 10 international units per ml no need for treatment whereas antibody level is less than 10 units then check for hbsag antigen level if the antigen is negative or there is an unknown source then go for booster dose or a complete series and if the patient has antigen level is positive then booster dose or complete series including immunoglobin also not only the vaccine but immunoglobin also to be given in the case patient and uh, the healthcare worker is not vaccinated immediate vaccine within 7 days along with immunoglobulin 0.06 ml per kg so this is the algorithm to be followed between patients who had already had vaccine for hepatitis b and those who have not had yet what are the principles of uh, post exposure prophylaxis no discriminatory non discriminatory it should be uniform for all and it uh, confidentiality be maintained and detailed informed consent to be obtained and institution should follow universal precautions strictly to reduce the incidence of needle stick injury later and universal precautions are intended to prevent the exposure of healthcare workers and patients to blood borne pathogens these must be practiced in regard to blood and blood fluids to all the patients regardless of their infectious state so this universal precaution is itself a short note question so you have to know what are all the things that you have to follow uh, hygiene and protection and all that and what are the universal pr pr precautions these include hand washing before and after all medical procedures safe handling and immediate safe disposal of shards not free capping needles using special containers for shard disposals using needle cutter and destroyers using forceps instead of fingers for guiding switches using vacuums wherever possible and safe decontamination of instruments use of protective barriers whenever it is indicated to prevent direct contact with blood or fluid like gloves masks goggles aprons and boots and a healthcare professional who has cut or abrasion should cover the wound before providing care so they should not do it with a uh, injured finger they should not continue the treatment so these are all called the universal precautions against uh, needle stick injury so these are some of the vaccines which are available hepatitis b canvac and uh, b vac and this is the regimen for international hepatitis b vaccine scheduled for all ages you require three doses one as a for uh, the infants, newborn infants less than one year at birth after one month after six months this is the three doses interval for uh, three dose vaccine series for children more than one year and adults one immediately on uh, vaccination one month later and six months later and the four dose combination of vaccine for infants less than one year which can be pentavalent or hexavalent so within 24 hours of birth six weeks of age 10 weeks of age and 14 weeks of age when you combine with other vaccines so this is the schedule that you want to know and this is the immunoglobulin human hepatitis b immunoglobulin is available which has to be given along with vaccine 
if the patient has got a positive HPH antigen also. So this is the form used for uh, reporting. Reporting formats vary according to the practices followed in the institution, but must be sent within six hours of injury to start the treatment appropriately. So the, these are the date, date of incident, time of incident, name of the exposed healthcare worker. These all things should be kept confidentially. It should not be publicized. So these are all very secret documents. And potentially infectious materials involved, whether it is blood or other sources of needle, sharp instrument, and route of exposure, needle contaminated or not, piercing skin with contaminated sharp, splashing or spraying of blood was there or not, potentially infective material, and other in the exposure circumstances. All these have to be given in that. The patients already infected with uh, hepatitis B should be notified boldly in the case records and the healthcare professionals should be cautioned. So all of you would have noticed some people who have HBS AG antigen positive, uh, all the hospitals would have written it in red ink in the front page itself. And uh, the nurses will usually tell you that this is a HBS AG positive case. So better you wear two pairs of gloves instead of one and try to do whatever procedure you want to do and you wear your mask and be safe. So this is a very important precaution that is followed in most of the hospitals. So this is a very important uh, uh, the warning that should be given to all healthcare professionals to prevent them getting infected. Okay. So that ends the two topics that we have to say for today. So, any questions on that? Are you all there? <laughs>